Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Um, I was going to do uh, a sort of wide-ranging um, run through the history of clinical trials, but uh, you would just get a tiny bit about a whole lot of things, and it probably wouldn't be that satisfactory. So um, I'm going to major on James Lind, uh, and I suppose it's a story about alternative facts. It's a story about um, economics. It's a story about technology. Um, it's a story about information transfer. It's a story about biases. Um, and uh, see if I can get my slides working. Yes. Um, and at the risk of virtue signaling when this is a sort of complex story of medical advance, I was pretty horrified when I discovered, and, and I'm not sure, it seems to be that you have to mention Donald Trump if you're doing any sort of talk these days, but I, I, I was pretty horrified when I saw Trump being connected with Andrew Wakefield, the guy that faked MMR um, uh, data. Um, and I was also horrified to see today's Times to see that uh, Wakefield is actually uh, back in Britain. Um, because these things do matter, and it is very difficult to find evidence to advance medicine. And it's always been very difficult to find evidence to advance medicine. Um, so, uh, at the risk of what may be an obvious question, I wonder, and uh, you, you probably hate audience participation, but um, who here has heard of James Lind? Okay, so, so not everybody, not everybody in the audience, because I, I seem to have been aware of James Lind um, most of my life, not consciously. I, I suspect it may have been, in fact, I went to try and find this out, whether it was a Ladybird book of Nelson. These were the days when they were real Ladybird books, and I, I was sure that Lind was mentioned in a Ladybird book of Nelson, but I, this was just a fake memory, actually. Uh, but, but so Lind and... Most people, when they hear of Lind, uh, think of scurvy. Uh, he, here's Lind. Um, and scurvy, of course, is cured by lemons. And this is his great book. And uh, that graphic was really expensive, by the way. We, we used up all our budget on the uh, 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 graphic. Um, in the 21st century, scurvy is a rare condition uh, that can develop if you don't have enough vitamin C in your diet. Um, unlike some vitamins, our bodies can't make vitamin C. And without vitamin C, uh, a protein called collagen, collagen can't be replaced and different types of tissues break down, leading to the symptoms of scurvy. Uh, and they include uh, muscle and joint pain, tiredness, the appearance of red dots on the skin, gums bleeding and swelling. Um, there are still cases of scurvy in 2016, and in 2017. Uh, deaths are rare, but uh, there was a sad death that was reported in The Guardian last year of an eight-year-old boy uh, who was suffering from scurvy. Um, and that's particularly sad because um, unlike lots of uh, medical conditions, um, treatment for scurvy is relatively straightforward. Uh, you take vitamin C supplements or you eat food that is high in vitamin C and you will probably be cruel, uh, uh, cured pretty rapidly. Um, and that's presumably why if you um, visit the, Edinburgh, the old Edinburgh University quadrangle in Teviot Place, which used to house the medical school, you'll find a large plaque uh, put up in 1955 by the sun-kissed growers of citrus fruit in California and Arizona. 
And the plaque calls James Lind the Hippocrates of naval medicine. It lists three of his four books and states that these works led to the conquest of scurvy, the development of modern naval hygiene, and the growth of tropical medicine. Um, and that is the sort of accepted story. Um, here's the, the precy from um, David Harvey's 200 page book, uh, uh, 202 book, Limes. Uh, this is the book here. Um, and in the preface, it says, Limes is the dramatic history of Dr. James Lynn's heroic efforts to find a cure for the dreaded disease of scurvy in the face of corrosive patronage and establishment antipathy of the times. Uh, Lind recommended lemons and oranges, yet he was unable to penetrate the admiralty high-mindedness or to persuade them to enforce the fruits universal application. Uh, as I said, this is a 300-page book, um, but in fact, uh, the only evidence we have, that the actual evidence of James Lind's life um, really is in quite a small article in the DNB. Um, so quite how it managed to be that padded out, I'm not sure. Um, the DNB covers most of what is known about James Lind. He was born in Edinburgh on 4th October 1716, the son of an Edinburgh merchant whose wife had medical connections. In 1731, Lind was apprenticed to George Langlands, an Edinburgh surgeon. And he's recorded as having attended a course of anatomy lectures in 1734 given by Professor Alexander Munro. After his surgical apprenticeship, Lynn joined the Royal Navy as a surgeon's mate on a ship captained by Rear Admiral Haddock, which is a great name for a ship's captain, who was uh, successfully attacking uh, Spanish shipping. Um, in 1740, during the War of the Austrian Succession, Lynn joined the 50-gun vessel Salisbury. In 1748, he retired from the Navy and returned to Enlightenment Edinburgh, where he set up a medical practice in what was a competitive field. Uh, he married Isabel Dickey, and they most probably set up home, according to Edinburgh's uh, nine, uh, 1752 tax record in an apartment in Patterson's Court in the heart of Edinburgh's old town. Um, and you can see um, part of Patterson's Court here. Um, it's uh, just at the top of the mound in Lady Stairs Court. Um, Lynn's life in Edinburgh would have almost all been in the old town. Um, his publisher uh, was in the Cowgate, and uh, he would have gone to the College of Physicians, um, uh, which you can see here. Uh, I was involved in um, a, a long correspondence with um, another institution which I could have put on this map, which was the um, uh, Freemasons Canongate Kill Winning Lodge. And they claimed that Lind was a member of the lodge. And sure enough, there was a James Lind who was a member, who, who was a Freemason. But the difficulty is, and this makes, is another problem when you're doing historical research into James Lind, there was another James Lind who was his cousin who was also a doctor. And people are often confused. And boy, the Freemasons took a lot of convincing. But we, we managed in the end. Um, Lind graduated MD in the University of Edinburgh in 1748. Um, he chose venereal disease as the subject for the required thesis. Uh, perhaps this was because of his naval experience. And in May 1750, he was elected a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Uh, during Lind's stay in Edinburgh, the book for which he's best known, A Treatise of the Scurvy, was published in 1753. 
The following year, Lind published a paper in the Scots magazine about the harmful leaching of lead salts used in earthenware glazes, and in 1757, his essay on the most effectual means of preserving the health of seamen in the Royal Navy. Um, in May 1758, Sir Alexander Dick, president of the Royal College of Physicians, received an elegant letter containing Lynn's resignation as college treasurer and reporting his appointment as chief physician to His Majesty's Royal Hospital at Hasler. Lynd continued to experiment and publish while working at Hasler, um, and he wrote these three papers. He retired um, in 1783 and in uh, typical 18th century fashion, arranged for his son John to succeed him in the post. Uh, he died in Gosport in 1794, and uh, we think that he's buried in the grounds of Porchester Church. And that's really all the evidence we have as to Lind. Um, so, Let's get back to um, 1753 and Lynn's treatise on the scurvy. Um, scurvy was high on the list of dangers facing those 18th century sailors who spent much time at sea. Although some authors suggest that its significance has been exaggerated. Um, for instance, Nicholas Rogers postulates in his very comprehensive book on naval history that, uh, and to quote him, it has been seriously suggested that a million British seamen died of scurvy in the 18th century, a figure which implies that everybody who served in the Navy died of scurvy approximately twice. Um, <clears throat> Roger also urges caution in discussing a disease whose name is, uh, was used by doctors as a catch-all term for anything they could not identify or cure. Um, he feels that uh, the real killer at sea uh, was fevers, especially those known as goal, camp, ship, or, um, uh, or malaria. Um, so here's uh, Lynn's book on the scurvy. Um, published in 1753, uh, this was the copy that Lind gave to the College of Physicians. Um, and however prevalent scurvy may or not have been, uh, Lind's a treatise on the scurvy in three parts containing an inquiry into the nature, cause and cure of that disease, together with a critical and chronological view of what has been published on the subject, was clearly recognised as an important book, even if it didn't have a catchy title. Um, after the 1753 edition, there were two subsequent editions in English, and there were French, Italian and German translations. This is um, where it gets a bit difficult when you get back to the Lind scurvy lemons story, uh, because unfortunately, uh, this book is long, difficult, and contradictory. Uh, he uses the work to wrestle with contemporary theories of the causes of scurvy and to put forward his own view that scurvy is a disease of faulty digestion and excretion exacerbated by environment. Uh, he believed there were multiple causes of scurvy, including diet, foul air, and lack of exercise. Uh, nevertheless, there, there are many interesting things in the book. Uh, for instance, it contains an early example of a systematic review of what has been written on the subject. And Lind makes clear in the preface that he prefers observation to theory and observes bluntly that before the subject could be set in clear and proper light, it was necessary to remove a great deal of rubbish. Uh, he describes in an appendix his use of early equivalents to Index Medicus, which is the, the crucial bibliography of um, all medical articles. Um, and he used a book uh, by an author called Martin Lippens, uh, Bibliotheca Realis, uh, to identify 
potentially relevant material. Um, and here is uh, Lippin's uh, bibliography. And Lind identified 54 books meriting critical appraisal. Uh, he wrote abstracts summarizing his views on each of them. Uh, and here are some of the books that uh, Lind consulted. I'm not going to go through them all, but some of them have got very nice illustrations. Um, and it's, uh, you, you have to indulge the librarian in me because I wondered where Lind would have consulted these books. And the College of Physicians Library uh, started in 1682, so it's extremely likely that uh, this was one of the places where he consulted the books. And we did, in fact, identify these books as having been in the collection when uh, uh, Lind was treasurer of the college. And we went through them, but sadly we couldn't find anything in Lind's handwriting, so sort of pointing at a passage and underlining bits, but um, it, it was an interesting exercise all the same. And you can see some of these books in the, uh, in the cases outside. You know, we, uh, this is an evidence-backed talk, and some of the evidence is, is outside. Um, Crucially, the treatise contains a description of a very early fair test. Um, although, again, um, the report of Lynn's controlled trial uh, comparing six purported treatments for scurvy is rather hidden away and occupies just four pages, unmarked by any subheading in what is a 450-page book. Uh, Lind reports the trial as having been undertaken in May 1747, while the Salisbury was at sea, enforcing a blockade in the English Channel. Uh, Lind's trial involved 12 sailors with scurvy who were as similar as I could have them, who were accommodated in the same quarters, the forehold, and had the same basic diet. Um, so his report is illustrating his awareness uh, of the need to guard against selection bias. And it shows how he tried to hold potential confounding factors uh, like clinical condition, environment, and basic diet constant. So he was comparing like with like. Um, with, he didn't state what method of allocation he used, you know, how he split up the people who were going into the trial. Um, but he allocated two men to each of six different daily treatments for a period of 14 days. Uh, and the six treatments were um, uh, litres of cider, uh, 25 millilitres of elixir vitriol. Elixir vitriol is dilute sulfuric acid. Um, 18 millilitres of vinegar, uh, three times throughout the day before meals. Uh, half a pint of seawater, two oranges and one lemon continued for six days only when the supply was exhausted. And that, that's quite a crucial point, actually. A medicinal paste made up of garlic, mustard seed, dried radish root, and gum myrrh. And this is the thing about scurvy and vitamin C. It's a dramatic effect. And he reports that the most sudden and visible good effects were perceived from the use of oranges and lemons. One of those who had taken them being at the end of six days fit for duty. The other was the best recovered of any in his condition and being now deemed pretty well was appointed nurse to the rest of the sick. <laughs> All well and good, but the least satisfactory part of Lind's treatise is that despite this apparently strong evidence, Lind leaves his readers confused about his recommendations. Despite the facts that references to the beneficial effects of fruits and vegetables outnumber references to any of the other purported treatments in the trial, Lind nowhere states clearly that citrus juice is a cure for scurvy. 
In the third and last, the 1772 edition of the treatise, Lind also refers to scurvy cases in the wards at Hasler Hospital. Um, and he says, to what has already been said of the virtues of oranges and lemons, I have now to add that in seemingly the most desperate cases, the most quick and sensible relief was obtained from lemon juice, by which I have relieved many hundreds of patients. But he's still promoting other remedies, and he mentions <coughs> infusion of malt as a cure for scurvy. So why did it take so long? Um, in many ways, this is the the wrong question. Um, but the, the dominant view is still represented by the precy of David Harvey's 2002 book on uh, Limes, which is this bit about bureaucratic bungling. Um, uh, and it's, it's, you know, that it was all the Admiralty's fault, and here was Lynn trying to get the uh, vitamin C, well, the oranges and lemons cure across. Um, and, and it's interesting because you can actually trace uh, the start of this viewpoint uh, to the 1893 Dictionary of National Biography, in which Lynn's biographer, uh, Norman Moore, wrote that the issue of an order by the Admiralty to supply the Navy with lemon juice in 1795, 40 years after Lynn's conclusive evidence of his worth, supplied Mr. Spencer with an effective illustration of administrative torpor in his study of sociology. Uh, this was Herbert Spencer, who was an eccentric um, but influential philosopher, social theorist, and sociologist. But there's little evidence that Lind ever clearly um, recommended the use of lemon juice to the Admiralty or to others. Another and perhaps crucial reason was that researchers had no concept of vitamins, let alone vitamin C, until Frederick Gowland Hopkins' paper on accessory food factors was published in 1912. Um, and, and this is where we, we do have big problems with theories and with physicians not wanting to uh, propagate medicines unless it fitted in with the theoretical framework. Um, uh, as Lind himself writes in the advertisement contained in the third edition of the treatise, the mischief attached by an attachment to elusive theories and false hypothesis is an affecting truth. But unfortunately, again, Lynn did not follow his own advice. He was reluctant to use uh, either clearly recommended treatments whose mechanism of action he didn't understand. Uh, Lind was not alone. Um, uh, there were many other 18th century researchers, and I once did try and sort of work out from Lynn, thinking that there was this sort of clear route, and you could go from one researcher to another. Uh, it, it doesn't work. But you, you see here people like Sir John Pringle, David McBride, Dr. Thomas Trotter, James Cook. Um, uh, they all contributed to the confusion in the second half of the 18th century. So, Another important part of the story is that it's a failure of information transfer. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're not seeing the wood for the trees, and I suspect that's probably still the same here as we wade through uh, tons of digital dross. Um, and I, I mentioned Lynn's bibliography at the start, and one book he doesn't refer to is this book here. Um, and this is by John Woodall, who was the first Surgeon General of the East India Company. And he reported on the anti scorbutic properties of lemons 136 years before Lynn's treatise in his 1617 book, The Surgeon's Mate. He recommended making sure that there is a good quantity of the juice of lemons sent in each ship. So this is in 1617. Uh, so in conclusion, um, Lind is rightly recognized for having taken care to compare like with like. Uh, he adopted a systematic approach when assessing the reports and opinions of earlier writers. And it should not be forgotten that he reported um, experiments to the Royal Society showing how 18th century technology could be used to distill fresh water from seawater. Or that his essay on the most effectual means of preserving the health of seamen was one of the first monographs devoted to occupational health. 
But I feel the jury is out on Lind and Scurvy. And we knew, I, I always thought that this is the sort of image I had of James Lind, and it's sort of sober looking man with a um, uh, you know, kindly looking face. Um, and, um, so, so for most of my Lind studies, that's what's been fixed on me. But, but things change. And thanks to the James Lind Library, we were contacted by someone in South Africa who had the original portrait. And you can see he's actually a much flashier figure and um, uh, quite, an ornate, um, quite an ornate waistcoat he's wearing. And I just wonder if that would have uh, um, introduced bias into my view of, of Lind. Um, if you are interested in the scurvy story, um, I can recommend uh, this book, which is, is, uh, came out in um, 1986 by Kenneth Carpenter. Uh, it's a fantastic book. It, it hasn't been bettered on uh, the story of scurvy and vitamin C. And uh, as Daisy said, um, the James Lind Library is a phenomenal resource for telling the history of controlled trials um, and how we uh, try and judge what treatments are best. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk backslash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.